Okay, so uh, welcome once again to Kabbalah Decoded. Um, check out our website, kabbalahdecoded.com. And uh, this video will be posted to YouTube um, about an hour after the class ends. <clears throat> All right. What we're going to do today is to discuss um, what we do in troubling times. It also has to do with what's called tikkun olam. Tikkun olam means uh, really fixing up the world. And how we go about that, what that, uh, what that really means, what that implies uh, for our daily activities. <clears throat> so, um, it is also, we're also going to contrast uh, two different approaches to life and to issues in life in general. One could be called the approach of Noah, and the other could be called, could be called the approach of Abraham. Avraham, Noah and Avraham, two different approaches to life and to issues that we have to deal with in life on a regular basis. So, um, let me switch my screen now to um, where you can see. All right, here we go. So we're in trouble times. <clears throat> Everyone can see that? Yeah? Okay, so, <clears throat> no? Um, oh, one second, why is it not sharing the screen? Okay, got it, that's better. Okay, now you can see it, right? Yeah. All right, so <clears throat> this time I, uh, <laughs> I had a chance to actually write the English in as well. Okay, so <clears throat> there's a verse in Jeremiah, <coughs> excuse me, which talks about it's a troubled time for Jacob, and from it he will be saved. <clears throat> it's a time of trouble. <clears throat> Now, uh, looking around the world today, we could certainly say that, the, you know, very, 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 very likely that today's times would uh, qualify for such a description. It's a troubled time. Now, what do we do? There's a teaching, an amazing teaching, actually, from the Baal Shem Tov, which slightly reinterprets, reframes the meaning of the verse without changing any of the words, but it's just sort of a reframe. Let's read it again. It is a troubled time for Jacob, and from it he will be saved, from which we understand that he'll be saved from the, trou from the, from the troubles that he's uh, going through, from the troubled times that Jacob, Jacob is just a symbol for um, the Jewish people in general, <clears throat> but... Um, from it he will be saved has the implication that he'll be saved from the troubles. The troubles will go away or something will be done to rescue him from his troubles. However, the Baal Shem Tov explains that if we take the word, the Hebrew word, the Hebrew word, mimena, that word over there, um, let me um, highlight it. Mimena, from it. The word mimena can also be read as not only from it, but by way of it. It is a troubled time for Jacob, and by way of it he will be saved. In other words, if Jacob knows how to transform the trouble into its opposite, then the very trouble itself will be his rescue. Now that's a sort of a, 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 bit, a bit of um, um, alchemy, I suppose you could say, <clears throat> transforming trouble into uh, you know sort of uh, lead into gold, right? <coughs> transforming lead into gold, uh, which the ancient alchemists uh, wanted to do. So in Kabbalah, this is not a far-fetched um, and unlikely scenario. In fact, Kabbalah gives us the wherewithal and the means 
to understand exactly how to do that, and we're going to discuss it. So, in order to understand that a little bit better, we have to go to the verse which we uh, spoke about last week, last Wednesday, actually, uh, which is the command to Noah to make a window in the ark, which we explained in the last class, uh, in the Wednesday class, means to make your words a source of light or at least an opening for light. The, the actual verse is Tzohar Ta'asele Teva, a source of light or a, um, uh, an opening for light, a window, make in the Teva in the ark, and we explained the ark means the word as well, right? Make, a, make an opening for the ark or for the word. For the word, in other words, your words should be full of light. Now, <clears throat> if you notice, um, the word Tsohar, um, let me put this in a, can you see that green color? I hope so. And the word Tsara are exactly the same letters. There's a Tzadi, this letter here, the Tzadi, there's a Resh, this letter here, the Resh, the Resh there, and there's a Hey over here. Just that the, the order of the letters is a little bit different. So the word Tsara and the word Sohar have the same three letters, and comes along Kabbalah and explains that one can transform trouble, Tsara, into Tsohar. Now, how is this done? <clears throat> so here's the word again, tsara. There's, there's a, one of the means, one of the methods that Kabbalah uses is called the transposition of letters. The same letters of something, the same, they, uh, I think I explained in, uh, in uh, a class a couple of weeks ago that the name of something is, the, is not, on, it's not only just a, a, a sort of a handle to it, it's, it's not only a, um, a reference or a referent. It is also a means by which we can, so to speak, manipulate. Manipulate is not a good word. It has negative connotations. But by which we can transform one pattern of letters into a different pattern of letters. It's the same basic, basic, uh, the same basic components, but the structure can be changed. In other words, if one can change the letters of trouble into the letters of a source of light by transposing the letters, by switching them around, then that will be a positive transformation. That will be a transformation into something that ultimately will emit light or at least let light in. Okay, so... How do we do it? Says Kabbalah, take the word as it is in its original character, Sara, meaning trouble. Start to look at the various combinations of this word. Now, three letters can build six, says the uh, Sefi Yitzira, three letters can build six words. Two letters build four words, three letters build six with six words, and so you go on, etc. three letters. So, these three letters, three unique letters, obviously. <clears throat> so, these letters build six words, of which four um, have importance uh, for us. Now, there is actually another one um, which also has meaning. But there's one. There's there. There is a um, there is a word a, a transport a transposition which has no meaning, um, and I'm just going to put that at the end, so you can see what it is. Rahatz doesn't have that. That doesn't have any meaning, so we're essentially going to cancel it out. Okay, but tsara again means trouble. Uh, should I write that in English over here? Trouble. All right. Now, Ratsa 
and actually the word the word hatsar the word hatsar means the one who is causing the trouble the one causing the trouble hatsar hatsar tsara so these two really go together they're not both combinations over here are negative combinations negative permutations now <coughs> This permutation over here is a, um, this is the same letters, but they can be read slightly differently. This one could be read as Ratsa means, can mean running. Running. And this over here can be read as Rote, willing, will. Sorry about that. Uh, will. Okay. And then that ultimately is the source of light. Okay, so this is what the Baal Shem Tov explains and uh, is, is a standard system in Kabbalah. From taking, taking from trouble and the one who is causing trouble and then by running in other words, by doing with alacrity, the, the emphasis is on doing and doing with alacrity. Something has to be done. It can't just be a mental exercise. It has to actually be um, something that involves the person completely and, and uh, um, um, an exercise which a person does with tremendous alacrity, alacrity and enthusiasm. So, in a time of trouble, if one runs with alacrity to do what it is that God wills, what God wants, Rotze. At a time of trouble, if we run to do what it is that God wants from us, then Tsara, the negative aspect, becomes Tsohar, becomes a source of light. So in other words, the transformation of negative into positive comes through, through a, a, a two-pronged two process. When we run with alacrity and eagerness and, and enthusiasm to do what it is that God wants, then we transform the negative into the positive. Okay, now... <clears throat> That's just the beginning. That is the way to approach issues which are already extant, they're already there. The problem is already there. How do we approach problems that did not happen yet? In other words, they're only sometime in the future. How do we deal with that? How do we deal with problems which are only... Um, so to speak, in potential. Okay. In order to be able to understand that, we have to understand something about Noah, about Noah. It says in the Midrash, <coughs> Midrashic literature, in the Midrash, Midrash Tanchuma, on this, uh, on Parshas Noah, it says that when the flood was over, and the ark came to rest on the mountaintops. The land was dry. No one knew that it was dry because he sent out the dove and so on and so forth and, um, and brought back an olive branch and everything was dried out. The land was dry. But he didn't leave the ark. So the Medrash explained he didn't leave the ark until God told him to leave the ark. So the Medrash explains why it was that Noah did not leave the ark until he was told to do so. He said to himself, I only entered the ark with God's permission. He told me to go in, Bo come into the ark, 
And I'm only going to leave with God's permission when God tells me to do that. I came in with permission, I'm going to leave with permission. I came in by way of a command, I'm only going to leave by way of a command. And then God tells him, Tzai Manateva, go out of the ark. <clears throat> There's another opinion in the Medrash, the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda Bar Eloi. Rabbi Yehuda Bar Eloi was a very, very uh, great sage and one who was accustomed to miracles, to performing miracles. <clears throat> Rehuda Ba'ilai said, if I would have been in his position, I would have smashed the door and gone out. <clears throat> I wouldn't have waited for a command. What's the basis, of, uh, the basis of their argument? The basis of the argument is this. Noah waiting for God's command indicated that he was, in a sense, a passive participant. Yes, he was a holy person. Yes, he was a righteous person. The Torah itself testifies to the fact that he was righteous. However, he was nevertheless, in a sense, a passive participant because he always waited for a command. Abraham, by way of contrast, did not wait for God's command. By his halech lefanai. Abraham goes before me. It says that Noah went together, so to speak, with God. In other words, he followed God's commands. But Abraham went on ahead. In other words, he did things which then became God's commands. So, Rabbi Huda Ba'elai was pointing out that the way to go about things is not to always wait for a command because that is that's only how you deal with a situation that already exists with a sorrow with it with a troubled time then it's already that's already functional then perhaps you have to wait for a command as to exactly what to do and how to transform one thing into the other that's only when you already have a tsara that you have to start working on making the tsara, the trouble, into a source of light, into a tsar. However, Abraham, Abraham, was not like that. And says, Rabbi Huda Ba'eloi, that's not the way you should be. You should be proactive. In other words, before the problem becomes a problem is when you should start attacking it. That's the concept of his halach lefonai, go before me, Abraham goes before God, in other words, he goes ahead and he sees that in a world that needs tikkun, in a world that needs rectification, you don't have to ask permission, you don't have to wait for a command. If you see that the world needs something, needs a tikkun, needs a rectification, and when we say the world, we don't mean the whole world necessarily, but just your corner of the world, your uh, little uh, backyard of the world, so to speak. When, if and when you see that that needs a rectification of one sort or another, don't wait to be commanded, don't wait to be told, don't wait for someone else to tell you or for God to tell you uh, to do something about it. Do something about it now. Do something yourself. Go ahead and do what has to be done. That is called in, um, there's a, actually a Hasidic expression which is called Lechatchila Ariber. In, in, it's uh, it's, explain, it's uh, a Yiddish expression. Lechatchila Ariber means from the outset, go over the top. Now, where did this come from? Uh, come from? There was a uh, great Rebbe named Rabbi Shmuel Lubavitch who once remarked that um, when there's a uh, when there's a time of trouble, what most people do is they sort of find try and find a way to skirt the issue. They sort of try and get around it, right? If they can't get around it, then they go underneath it. In other words, they duck until ad yav or zam until the bad time passes over until things you know calm down a little bit and they they keep a very low profile, so to speak, until things go away. And if they can't do it by going around, in other words, avoiding, or by going under, uh, ducking until it passes, then what do they do? Then they, uh, they, 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 if they can't do either of those two, then they go over the top. In other words, I'll explain what that means in a minute. 
In other words, lechatchila ariba, then they go over the top. However, he says, as far as I'm concerned, we should start off with going over the top, right? Going over the top, in other words, transcending the issue, not avoiding the issue, and not ducking until it passes, just sort of um, bearing grin and bear it until it's gone, but from the outset, over the top. In other words, transcend the whole issue from the outset. Now, what does this, what does this mean? So there is a um, there's a word in Hebrew called teva, teva, or ha teva, nature. Um, I can just type it in quickly so that you can see it on the screen. Um, just one second, I'll switch the screen as well. Now, what's it doing over here? All right, let me just switch the screen so you can see. Um, share screen, here we go. Okay. All right. Nature. Right? Teva nature. Now, if we take the word teva, um, ha teva, ha, uh, ha teva, is the numerical value of the word ha teva is 86. And 86 is the same gematria, the same numerical value as the, as the name Elohim. Elohim. Elohim is the manifestation of God in a limited way, a limited manifestation, limited revelation. The creation was brought about through the name Elohim. Brejit bara Elohim et hashamayim et haaretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, but the name used for God over there is the name of constriction, of restricted revelation. All of the names of God that we find in Hebrew, uh, that we find throughout the Torah, um, a name is only a um, an indication of a certain set, a certain type of action. When Moses asks God his name, and Moshe Rabbeinu asks God his name, he said, this is the Midrash telling us, he said, Shmi atamavakesh leida, my name you want to know. According to my deeds, I am called. And the Midrash goes on to explain, and so on and so forth. Shem Kel All of the different names that we find throughout the Torah are only names of activities. They're names of relationships. So for example, um, a human being asks, you have one name as, uh, let's say, as a parent, mother, father. You have a name as a child to your parents, son, daughter. You have a relationship to a spouse, husband or wife. You have a name in relationship to uh, your work. Either you're the boss or you're the employee, the employer, employee, uh, and so on and so forth. There's all kinds of different relationships, and those relationships are um, indicated by different names. Your uh, employer would not call you ma or pa, or whatever, whatever, however you call mother, father, right? He would call you um, and relate to you in a uh, as an employee or vice versa, an employee to an employer, right? You wouldn't call them by their uh, by 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 the names that are used in different circumstances and different situations. Similarly, the various names of God that we find throughout the Torah, it's all one God but different names indicating different types of activity. But there is an essential name. That essential name is the name Havaya Yud K Vav K, spelled Yud He and Vav and He. But the manifestation of divine power in nature is associated with the name Elohim. 
with that name, the name Elohim, which is the same numerical value as the word Hateva, nature. Nature as an object, so to speak. Equals 86. So, why is that important to know? It's important to know because the concept of um, the concept of nature and the concept of uh, the name Elohim again implies a limited revelation. So, creation, all of creation and all its vastness and all the uh, galaxies and uh, and, and uh, millions of uh, light years away and so on and so forth, all of it is all only Shem Elohim. All of nature is Shem Elohim. And the idea of the name of Elohim also has to do with a certain sort of, let's call it linearity. In other words, it's a cause and effect relationship. When it comes to um, when it comes to nature, there is a cause and effect relationship. One thing causes the other, and it's sort of a linear relationship. But there's another aspect to um, dealing with issues. In other words, the way of dealing with issues in the natural way is to either avoid a negative issue or duck until it passes. That's called the Shem Elohim manner of dealing with things. But there's also the Shem Havaya manner of dealing with things, the, the divine, essential divine name, manner of dealing with things, and that's called L'Chathil Ariba from the top, from the, from the outset, go over the top. In other words, transcend it completely. It transcends the world. What is this? How is it possible to transcend? The, tra the transcending of the world has to do essentially with the idea of focusing on the goal. What's the goal? Focusing on the, uh, on the ultimate purpose of creation. The ultimate purpose of, crea of creation is not the name Elohim, limited revelation. The ultimate purpose of creation is infinite revelation. Infinite revelation, <coughs> excuse me, infinite revelation being um, characterized by the name yud ke vav -ke, the transcendent name of uh, the transcendent name of God. That's the ultimate purpose. Abraham, the way he acted in the world was he didn't react to situations. He knew what it was that he had to do. He knew what it was that was necessary in this world. And therefore, he was able to um, go ahead, so to speak, go ahead of God. The story is told also, a story, a story is told in the Medrash also about Abraham, that Abraham was one day walking and tending his sheep um, in, on the edge of the desert, and he came across a beautiful palace. But the palace was burning. Yeah, I'll get to that, Martin, in a minute, yeah. Um, Right, Marty, that's correct. Um, so the palace was burning, and Abraham, in astonishment, looks around and he sees no one's doing anything. And he says, um, Is there no owner of this palace? And a voice comes out of heaven and says, Ani balabais labirazu, I am the owner of the palace. God's voice comes out from heaven and he hears, I'm the owner of this palace. And the implication basically is that if you see that the palace is burning, don't wait for the owner to do something. You go ahead and do it. You go ahead and do what, what, uh, what needs to be done. Similarly, when Abraham was told to go and offer up his son, which never actually happened, it was a test. It wasn't intended to actually happen. All kinds of barriers and restrictions and things like trying to prevent him from getting there. All of a sudden, there was a river that he couldn't cross, a raging river. 
So just walking to the river, went up to his neck, over his head, and then the river parted and it wasn't there. And so on and so forth. There were all kinds of barriers that came upon his way, uh, that came in his way. Said Abraham, what, are you, what, am, what am I supposed to do with these barriers? I know what I, I have a goal in mind. God told me to go to a certain place and that's where I'm going. I'm not waiting for instructions as to what to do at the side of the river. I was told go and I went. I'm going, that's it. I'm going forward. I know where I have to go to and we'll let God take care of the rest. That was his way of approaching things. That's called the Malamina Teva, above nature, supernatural, transcending nature. Sorry, just going to switch that off. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, the idea, therefore, is that there's two ways of approaching issues. One way of approaching the issue is when it's already a problem, then you have to deal with it in the, in the same sense as Noah dealt with it. You have to follow the commands that you're given, what it is that God wants, in other words. You have to follow the, um, uh, the commands, and that way you'll deal with the issue. However, Abraham was a person who understood that don't let an issue become an issue. Deal with it early on, deal with it beforehand, deal with it in a way of transcending nature. Don't wait for the cause and effect to start snowballing and then you have a much bigger problem to start off with. From the beginning, go over the top. Go over into a transcendent mode of you taking the responsibility and you going ahead and, uh, and saying, I see that a problem is about to happen I'm going to take care. I'm not going to wait for someone to tell me to do something. I'm going to go ahead and do what has to be done ahead of time in order to, first of all, transfer, uh, uh, prevent a problem, and secondly, to transform what could have been a problem into a stepping stone to a higher um, sense of the presence of God in the world. That is what Abraham represented. So therefore, when it comes to dealing with, uh, when it comes to dealing with issues, the second way is much preferable to the first. From the beginning over the top, and um, in order to achieve that, in order from the beginning over the top, over the top of the problem, before the problem really becomes a problem, as Marty pointed out um, in, in, the, uh, in the chat over here, he first has to go to himself. It says the, the, the verse um, in this week's Torah reading starts off with the, with the words, Lech Lecha, go towards yourself. But what does that mean? Go towards yourself. You, as you are down here, have to go towards your higher self, your ideal self, who you are in your essence. In other words, don't wait don't wait as sort of the reflection of yourself which is down here. Don't wait for that to have to deal with issues. Go to the original source, go to who you are in your essence, and work from there in order to deal with uh, the issues that, you, uh, that you're facing. Okay, um, we're going to have to keep it a little bit shorter today because I have, um, um, I have to speak to someone another city in a few minutes so we're gonna call it a day here and uh